entities, if they did indeed exist. It is difficult to predict what the attitude of international law will be with regard to the occupation by celestial peoples of certain locations on our planet. But the only thing that can be foreseen is that there will be a profound change in traditional concepts. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. Army officers say the missile, found sometime last week, has been inspected at Roswell, New Mexico, and sent to Wright Field, Ohio, for further inspection. When news of a crashed saucer near Roswell, New Mexico hit the airwaves, the government was ready. The saucer quickly became a downed weather balloon, and a policy of evasion became the order of the day. It would last for decades. I think the U.S. Air Force explanation that mogul balloons what crashed at Roswell is just specious. Uh, first of all, the timing is wrong. The technologies are wrong. Uh, certainly pieces of a mogul balloon or the sensor systems attached there too would have been identifiable, and they aren't. I believe that these kinds of answers actually do a disservice both to the American people and to the Air Force itself. I'm here to discuss the so-called flying saucers. The Air Force interest in this problem has been due to our feeling of an obligation to identify and analyze to the best of our ability anything in the air that may have the possibility of threat or menace to the United States. In pursuit of this obligation since 1947, we have received and analyzed between one and two thousand reports. We've been able to explain them as uh, hoaxes as erroneously identified friendly aircraft, as meteorological or electronic phenomena, or as light aberrations. With all due respect to the Air Force, I believe that some of them will prove to be of interplanetary origin. During a three-year investigation, I found that many pilots have described objects of substance and high speed. One case, pilots reported their plane was buffeted by an object which passed them at 500 miles an hour. Obviously, this was a solid object, and I believe it was from outer space. I am certain that there have been several recoveries of alien craft and bodies in the United States. I'm using the word several advisedly. That it could be very conservative. Roswell was not the first incident. My feeling is that uh, the Missouri incident in 1941 as related by the Reverend William Huffman to his granddaughter did indeed occur. I believe there's a cover-up on the UFO subject because so many different things point to it. Clear, well-documented reports from credible witnesses, a lot of documentary information from the archives, a pattern of denial from the government that looks almost silly, a pattern of denial from scientists that is clearly informed not by facts but by some kind, I would say an indirect kind of intimidation. The reason I feel the Air Force and the government in general is trying to uh, destroy my father is so that they can destroy the Roswell event. Uh, that must mean that there really is something there that they have to hide. That this must be kept from the public at all costs. When you're dealing with the military, especially in, in matters of secrecy, the idea is to deceive. There is a manual, uh, you well know, that I'm J-12, which also states to uh, discourage witnesses, to uh, put out false statements, to protect the secrecy of this 1947 event. One of the first documents that I got was entitled Extraterrestrial Entities and Technology Recovery and Disposal. The content of the Special Operations Manual is really quite stunning. It explains why it's so important to keep it secret and how they go about the process, how they keep the public in the dark, what lies they tell them, what deceptive statements. Great care must be taken to preserve the security of any location where extraterrestrial technology might be retrievable for scientific study. The most desirable response would be that nothing unusual has occurred. 
it may become necessary to issue false statements to preserve the security of the site. We continued to study the Special Operations Manual and look at each aspect of it and try to determine the authenticity of it. Subtleties like the use of the term central intelligence instead of central intelligence agency show a subtle amount of arrogance that is indicative of the central intelligence agency in 1954. The 32-page Special Operations Manual also includes the Extraterrestrial Technology Classification Table. It details procedures for retrieval of crashed saucers, how to handle organic matter, and where to ship the bodies. The Blue Lab at Wright Field in Ohio was the secret destination for some of this material. A young woman named June Crane worked in a classified office at the base. Shortly before she died, she told her story. I started at Wright Patterson in 42. I was 18 years old. And all of the people I worked with were older than me. So I'm probably the last survivor of my lab group and probably the last one still around to talk about it. I had a Q clearance. I worked with scientists and with engineers. I knew a man named Clarence Smith. He was a master sergeant. He came in one day before we started to work very upset. Clarence told us that his plane brought back two bodies in crates from New Mexico. When I asked which plane had crashed, he said, it wasn't a plane, it was a flying saucer. Well, they knew of three crashes that I was aware of by 1952. Maybe there were more. In 52, there was a crash cover-up. Roswell was in 47. That balloon story was a damn lie then, and it's still a lie. When I interviewed June, I realized that I was getting a rare glimpse into another period of time that was right at the heart of the mystery of ufology. I began to understand the full extent of the cover-up, the difference between what was commonly known to engineers and scientists and what is probably still known to this day and what has been revealed to the public. An officer showed me a piece of metal. I think that it was Lieutenant Rose. He was one of those guys in the office who liked to talk to me. Lieutenant Rose asked me to break it up, tear it apart if I could. He handed me the scissors. I couldn't dent it or cut it. I asked him what it was and where it came from. He said that it was a piece of a spaceship. According to the Special Operations Manual, the physical evidence from the crash was to be collected and transported to an undisclosed location for study. That location appears to have been the mysterious Area 51. I'm satisfied and very pleased that there is good reason to say that uh, Area 51 was created in the early 50s. Uh, now we have that reason. We didn't have that reason before. Skeptics have claimed that Area 51 did not exist when the Special Operations Manual was published in 1954. But according to this Las Vegas newspaper, a huge government installation began construction in the Nevada desert in early 1951. The project was cloaked in a security blackout and has remained so to this day. Many believe it is where the technology of these alien craft is being studied. It causes one to ask the question, and I don't know the answer, but to ask the question of to what extent might we have been successful in reverse engineering some of the discoveries from crashed flying saucers. Now that the sound barrier has been cracked, the thermal or heat barrier is the goal of the experimental X-2 rocket plane. The stainless steel bullet designed to stand speeds of more than 2,000 miles an hour is released. On these tests, the rocket plane is not fueled, but in future runs, when it attains maximum velocity, heat developed by friction may reach more than 1,000 degrees. Here, the ability of metal and alloys to withstand the heat are expected to provide valuable data for projected spaceships and satellites. The slim metal ship may furnish some of the answers as the world enters the space age. The Atomic Energy Commission and Nuclear Energy Propulsion of Aircraft are currently conducting research for advanced technologies in atomic engines and radical propulsion studies. 
integration of hydrogen-based fuels and electro-hydrodynamic technology may open up for us development of super aerodynes with Mach 5 capabilities. Some of the technology, yes, they have improved on or discovered and, and it's being used today. Yeah, I think everything that uh, we were involved in from 1942 clear up to 1947 was, was justified. Just weeks after the crashes at Roswell, President Harry Truman named James V. Forrestal as the first Secretary of Defense. On September 24, 1947, a top secret research and development operation was established under his direction. It was called Majestic 12. It's my understanding that MJ-12 was basically a sort of oversight administrative policy-making group, very small, and that the people who were responsible to MJ-12 were very select people in various branches of the intelligence community, the military, and military department. So it was very compartmented. It wasn't some huge operation. MJ-12 supervised several agencies involved in various aspects of the UFO phenomenon. But only the 12 Majestic members knew the whole story, and they reported only to the president on a need-to-know basis. One of the reasons that there are so few leaks is that nine out of ten people are loyal Americans when they sign a security oath and they are rigorously defending what they've agreed to. Namely, they're not going to tell anybody. And so therefore, really only one out of a thousand persons ever gets close to leaking the story. One of the most stunning documents that arrived in Tim Cooper's mailbox was the first annual report of the Majestic 12 operation. And this was a primary report and then three annexes comprising 17 pages. M many unusual commentaries were included. Everything from missing soldiers to airplanes that have been shot down while chasing UFOs. There's a section called Government Policy of Control and Denial. One of the most difficult aspects of controlling the perception in the public's mind of government attempts of denial and ignorance is actual control of the press. People ask, how on earth would you keep a secret like that so long? And the way they did it was to begin with the security procedures that we developed during the Manhattan Engineering Project for the first atomic bomb. Compartmentalization to tell each group only a little bit of the story, so hardly anybody has the big picture. 